For all the sleep I got that night, I may as well have stayed up with the hoot owls. Every time I closed my eyes, I'd start seeing monkeys. They would come by in a long line, one behind the other, leaping and squealing. Each monkey had a price tag hanging from his neck, telling how much he was worth. I wouldn't get too excited until that hundred dollar monkey came leaping by. Every time he passed, he would stop and laugh at me. I'd wake up, wringing wet with sweat and having an upside down fit. When I finally did fall asleep, I had a wonderful dream about owning a beautiful paint pony and a brand new 22. I was riding like the wind, shooting right and left. I was the first one up the next morning. In fact, I even beat our old red rooster, and that was getting up early. I was out at the woodpile, splitting kindling, when he came sailing out of the high, out of the hen house, ruffling his feathers. He hopped upon the rail fence, threw his head back, and told everything within hearing distance that it was a beautiful Ozark morning and it was time to start stirring. Papa came out of the house with a milk bucket in his hand, yawning and rubbing the sleep from his eyes. He looked at me and said, You're up kind of early, aren't you? I guess I am, Papa, I said. I wanted to get my chores done so I'd have a good day at those monkeys. I believe I can have a sack full of them before sundown. Looking concerned, Papa said, You know, I've been thinking about this monkey catching business of yours. I still think there's more to it than you think there is. Those monkeys may be too smart for you. Papa, I said, surely monkeys couldn't be any smarter than coons are. And I've caught all kinds of coons. Why, I've even caught a couple of red foxes. And you know how smart they are. I know, Papa said. But it might be a little different catching monkeys. I just hope you haven't overloaded your wagon. It's not good for a boy to want something with all of his heart and then be disappointed. Things like that can hurt for a long time. The way Papa was carrying on had me a little worried. Then I remembered what my grandpa had told me. Papa and I... Papa, I said... Grandpa says that there never was an animal that couldn't be caught. Well, I hope your grandpa knows what he's talking about, Papa said, walking off toward the barn. I thought, Mama never would get breakfast ready, but she finally did, and I set a new record for the time it takes a 14-year-old boy to eat a meal. While I was out in our cellar getting some apples, Mama fixed a lunch for me and put it in a paper bag. After putting my traps, lunch, and apples in a gunny sack, I called Rowdy and lit out for the bottoms to make my fortune. Just as we walked out of our fields into the thick timber of the bottoms, a big, fat swamp rabbit popped out of the brush pile and tore down a game trail. Old Rowdy saw the rabbit about the same time as I did. He lunged and let out one of his famous catch-a-rabbit balls. For a second, I was so excited I almost forgot myself and was just about to urge Rowdy on when I thought of that old man of the mountains. By this time, Rowdy was right on that swamp rabbit's tail, bawling every time his feet would touch the ground. No, Rowdy, no, I yelled. Let him go. Rowdy threw on the brakes, turned, and looked at me as if he knew that I had lost my mind. That was the first time I ever called him back from chasing something. He couldn't understand it at all. He just stood there in the middle of the trail looking very surprised. Come here, boy, I said, slapping my leg with my hand. I see right now that if I don't have a talk with you, 
you're going to mess everything up. Rowdy came to me, but not willingly. He couldn't understand what had come over me. Kneeling down, I put my arms around him and said, Look, boy, we're not hunting for anything today but monkeys. And whatever you do, don't catch anything else. I don't care if something runs over you. Just let on like you didn't even see it. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but I mean it. You see, there might be an old man sneaking around these woods looking out for all the animals. And if we catch anything, he'll cause us to have bad luck. All he has to do is point a stick at us and we'll have all kinds of bad luck. We couldn't catch a June bug, much less a monkey. Even though I tried my best to explain to Rowdy that I didn't want him to catch anything, I don't think he understood why. It's hard to explain things like that to a rabbit hunting hound. Side by side and walking as quietly as tomcats on the prowl, we moved on into monkey country. It was so still in the bottoms, I could hear my heart thumping. Every nerve in my body was as tight as the iron bands around the rain barrel. I went right back to the bur oak tree where Rowdy had treed the monkey and started looking it over. I looked on every limb and in each dark shadow, not being able to see anything that even looked like a monkey. I was beginning to get a little discouraged when all at once, from somewhere close by, something let out a cry that rang through the bottoms like a blacksmith's anvil. The cry didn't sound scary. It was more like a warning cry. Not being able to identify what had made the racket scared me a little. My old heart started flopping around. It seemed like every time I got scared a little, my old heart was the first one to know about it. I never could understand why it acted that way. To make things worse, old Rowdy growled way down deep and started walking around stiff-legged, like when he was getting ready for a fight. In a quavering voice, I whispered to Rowdy, What in the world was that? It couldn't have been a monkey. Monkeys are little bitty things. Whatever made that racket must have been as big as a barn. That one loud cry was all I heard, and again the silence closed in all around us. I sent Rowdy to do a little sniffing around. This was an old game to me, and one I never grew tired of playing. I could follow every movement my old dog made by ear. Over my left, a twig snapped, and there was a padding of soft feet. Then ahead of me, a small bush wavered as his ghostly shadow passed beneath. He moved on to my right, and I heard the scratching of his claws on bark as he walked a log. Ending up behind me, I heard his loud snuffings as he rustled in the leaves. Old Rowdy had made a complete circle around me, and I knew that if the tracks of anything dangerous had crossed the line of that circle, he would have let me know about it. Rowdy was gone for about five minutes. When he came back, he didn't act like he had seen anything more than a grasshopper. As if he didn't have a worry in the world, he sat down on his rear and started digging at a flea that wasn't even there. Feeling much better, I started setting my traps like Grandpa had told me. All around the bur oak, about three feet out from the trunk, I dug six small holes in the soft soil. Then one by one, I mashed the trap spring down with my foot and set the triggers. Very carefully, I placed a trap in each hole and I covered it with leaves. I didn't tie the trap chains to anything, 
because I didn't figure that a little monkey could do much climbing with a trap on his foot. Then I took six apples and punched a nail down deep in each one. Tying short pieces of string to the heads of the nails, I hung an apple to the underbrush above each trap. When I was finished, I had a complete circle of traps around the trunk of the burr oak tree. Backing off to one side, I took a good look at my trap setting. It looked like a pretty good job to me. In fact, at that moment, I felt sure that Daniel Boone couldn't have been more proud of me. The traps were completely hidden. All I could see was those big red apples hanging there. They looked so good, I kind of wanted to take a bite out of one myself. I was still standing there admiring my work when, from the corner of my eye, I thought I saw a movement in the branches of a sycamore tree. It was just a flash, and I didn't see it again, but I was pretty sure that I had seen something. Picking up my gunny sack, I whispered to Rowdy, I'm not sure, boy, but I think I saw something. It could have been a monkey. Come on, let's hide and see what happens. About 35 yards away, but still in view of my traps, I found a small opening in a thick stand of elders. It was a dandy hiding place, and I proceeded to make myself comfortable. Taking my lunch and apples from the gunny sack, I laid them to one side and sat down on the empty sack. Now, I never did like to wait for anything. It seemed that half my life had been wasted away waiting for things. I had to wait for Christmas and for Thanksgiving. Then there was a long spell of waiting for spring and fishing time. Now, I was waiting for a monkey. The longer I sat there, the more comfortable I became. First I got hungry, then I got thirsty. The sack I was sitting on got hard as a rock and my tailbone started hurting. I got hot and I began to sweat. Deer flies and mosquitoes came and started gnawing on me. Just about the time that I had convinced myself that there wasn't a living thing within a hundred miles of me, up popped a monkey and out popped my eyes. I never did know where the monkey came from. One instant, there wasn't as much as a jaybird around my traps. Then as quick as Mama was with a peach tree switch, there was a monkey. I could have sworn that he just popped up out of the ground. Anyhow, there he was, standing on his spindly legs, staring at those big red apples. I held my breath, watched, and waited. For several seconds, the monkey just stood staring at those apples and twisting his head as if he were trying to make up his mind about something. Then he started jumping around and squealing and making all kinds of noises. The next thing that happened, all but caused me to have a jerking spell. It started raining monkeys. They seemed to come from everywhere, down from the branches of the burr oak tree and from out of the underbrush and everywhere else. There were big monkeys and little monkeys, fat monkeys and skinny monkeys. I was paralyzed. I looked like, it looked like 10 jillion monkeys, leaping and squealing. They bunched up about 10 feet from my traps and started chattering as if they were talking something over. Before the monkey showed up, Rowdy had been lying at my side. Growling and showing his teeth, he started getting to his feet. He was getting ready to tie into those monkeys and I knew it. I laid my hand on his back and I could feel his rock-hard muscles nodding and quivering. Rowdy, I whispered, for heaven's sake, don't do anything now. These monkeys are worth more money than we'll ever see the rest of our lives. If you make any noise and scare them away, I'll tie you in the corn crib for a year, 
and I won't even give you a drink of water. Of course, I didn't mean that, but Rowdy thought I did. He lay down again and kept his mouth shut. One little monkey, bolder than the others, left the bunch and started over toward my traps. I reached for my gunny sack and got ready. Just when I thought for sure that monkey was going to walk right under my trap, the same loud cry that I had heard before rang out through the bottoms. As if the cry were some kind of signal, the monkey stopped chattering and stood still. The one that I thought I was going to get in my trap hurried back to the bunch. I could tell that whatever had made the cry was much closer now than it had been before. And I didn't feel too good about it. Rowdy, I whispered, you keep your eyes open and whatever it is that's squalling like that, don't let it get too close to us. The way old Rowdy was sniffing and looking, I could tell whatever he was mad, he was mad or scared. I couldn't tell if he was mad or scared. This didn't help me at all. I put a lot of confidence in old Rowdy. And if he was scared, then it was time for me to be getting away from there. I was trying to make up my mind what to do when I heard the cry again. This time it was so close, it made my eardrums ring. My hair flew straight up and I felt as if it was pushing the top of my old straw hat. The noise was coming from above me. I started looking around in the treetops. On the limb of a big sycamore, I saw something. At first, I thought it was a boy. It looked just like a small boy standing there on a limb. I wondered what he was doing up there in the tree, screaming his head off. Maybe he had climbed the tree and couldn't get down. I'd done that several times, and Papa had, had to come and help me get down. Then again, he might be a crazy boy. Daisy told me that crazy people did all kinds of things like that. I forgot about being scared and got kind of mad. Rowdy, I whispered, I don't know if that's a boy or not, but if it is, he's sure messing things up for us. If he keeps screaming like that and scares the monkeys away, I'm going to wear him out. Just then, the thing moved out on the limb into some sunlight, and I got a better look at it. I could see then that it wasn't a boy, but it was some kind of a black, hairy animal. It had short, stubby legs, long arms that hung down almost to the limb it was standing on. When I discovered that it didn't have a tail, I didn't know what to think. I had never seen an animal that didn't have a tail of some kind. It was too far away to tell what color its eyes were, but I have sworn that they were as red as our old red rooster. Anything that had red eyes always did scare me. Goose pimples jumped out all over me. My old heart started running around inside me like a scared lizard. Rowdy, I whispered in a shaky voice. That's an animal, all right, but I've never laid eyes on anything that looked like that before, and I just don't like the looks of it. I had just about decided that my monkey-catching days were over and was getting ready to get away from there when I remembered that my grandpa told me about that hundred-dollar monkey. He had said that it was different than the other monkeys and that thing I was looking for it sure didn't look like those other monkeys. Just then a big monkey let out another cry. And running to the end of the limb, he leaped high into the air. I was so startled by this, I stood up. I thought sure that he had sprouted wings and was flying away. Instead, he lit in the branches of the bur oak tree and using those long arms, 
He started dropping down from limb to limb and landed on the ground between the little monkeys and my traps. All this happened so fast, it let me a little bit, it left me a little bit breathless. I thought squirrels could move around in the timber, but they couldn't do anything that that monkey couldn't do. Every move he made was as sure as Daniel Boone's musket and as smooth as Dasher in Mama's old churn. All the time this had been going on, the little monkeys hadn't made a sound. They just stood there in a bunch, watching every move the big monkey made. About that time, one of them decided that as long as there were some apples around, he might as well have one. He left the bunch, and with his skinny tail sticking straight in the air, he started toward my traps. The big monkey saw this and went all to pieces. He started jumping up and down and making deep grunting noises as if he were talking to the little monkeys. The little monkeys seemed to understand what the big monkey was saying. He squealed like someone had stepped on his tail and scurried back to the others. It was hard for me to believe what I had seen. Yet it was as plain as the stripes in a rainbow. That big monkey had known that that little monkey was in danger. And in his monkey talk, he simply told him so. Rowdy, I whispered, did you see what the monkey was doing? He was talking to that little monkey. That's what he was doing. My grandpa didn't tell me that they could talk to each other. As if he were proud of the fact that he had knocked me out of a $2 reward the big monkey then did something that all but caused me to swallow my Adam's apple. Looking straight at my hiding place, he peeled his lips back, opened his mouth, let out another one of those squalls. When he did, I got a good look at his fighting tools. I had thought that our old mules had big mouths and teeth. But they were nothing compared to what that monkey had. To me, it looked as if you could have thrown a pumpkin straight down his throat and never scratched the peeling on one side or one of his long teeth. Holy smokes, Rowdy, I whispered. Did you see those teeth? You'd better think twice before you jump on him. He could eat you up, collar and all. Old Rowdy didn't seem to be the least bit scared. If I had said sick him, he would have torn out those elders like a cyclone. He may have taken a whipping, but there would have been a lot of monkey hair flying around while it was going on. I didn't have to worry about the big monkey jumping on us. Instead, he turned, and still making those deep grunting noises, he walked up within two feet of a trap and stopped. For several seconds, he just stood there looking at the apples and all around at the ground. He kept making funny little noises as if he was talking to himself. The strain was almost more than I could stand. My insides got all knotted up and I felt like I was going to bust wide open. If the monkey hadn't done something about then, I think I would have. Instead of stepping in my trap, he just reached out with one of those long arms and took a hold of the apple and pulled on it until the nail came out. Holding the apple in his paw, about like I would if I were eating one, he opened his huge mouth, took one bite, and tossed what was left to the little monkeys. Now this caused a loud commotion. The little monkeys started fighting over the apple. I never heard so so much squealing and chattering. In no time, there wasn't so much as a seed left. I sat there as if I were frozen to the ground and watched that big monkey walk all around the burr oak, taking the apples and never stepping in a trap. 
One bite from each apple seemed to be all he wanted. What was left was tossed to the little monkeys. When the last apple had disappeared, the big monkey did something that made me wonder if I wasn't seeing things. He started turning somersaults and rolling around on the ground. At the same time, he was making the bottoms ring with a peculiar noise that he hadn't made before. Now, I had never heard a monkey laugh and didn't even know they could. But as I sat there watching the capers of that big monkey, it didn't take me long to figure out what he was doing. He was laughing at me. I was sure of it. I even remembered a dream I had about the $100 monkey, how every time he came leaping by, he would stop and laugh at me. The little monkey seemed to know that something funny was going on, they started screeching and chattering like a bunch of squirrels in a hickory nut tree. My neck and face got all hot. I knew I was blushing, but I couldn't help it. That was the first time I had ever had a monkey laugh at me. I looked at old Rowdy. The way I was feeling, if he had been laughing, I would have taken a stick to him. But Rowdy wasn't laughing. He was just as serious about catching those monkeys as I was. All at once, the big monkey stopped making a fool out of himself and turned to the little monkeys. Uttering a couple of those deep grunts, he just seemed to rise up in the air like a fog off the river and disappeared into the branches of the bur oak tree. And the little monkeys followed him, zip, 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 one behind the other. After the monkeys had all disappeared, it got so still around there, you could have heard a grasshopper walking. I looked at Rowdy, and Rowdy looked at me. Did you ever see anything like that, Rowdy? I said. Grandpa was right when he said that that monkey was smart, but I didn't think he was that smart. Why, he knew all the time that we were here, and he sat right up there on that sycamore limb and watched me set my traps. Then he stole all my apples and laughed at me. Now, how do you like that? My first go around with the monkeys left me a little discouraged, but not too much. After all, my grandpa had taught me practically all there was to know about trapping business. I figured it was just a matter of time until I'd have them all in the sack. Trying to act like nothing had just happened, I said, Rowdy, that monkey may not know it, but he's messing around with one of the best trappers in these Cherokee Hills. If he comes back one more time, we'll see who does the laughing. Let's try the old mouse-catching trick on him. I think that will stop his laughing business. Rowdy whined and licked my hand. That gave me a lot of confidence, and I felt much better. Taking three more of my apples, I set them up on a log. Then taking my pocket knife, I cut them in half. Walking over to where my traps were, I lifted them from their hiding places and tripped the triggers with a stick. Untying the strings from the nails in the bushes, I used the short pieces to tie half an apple to the trigger of each trap. I wrapped those pieces of apple to the top of the triggers as tightly as I could, and I tied the ends of the strings in hard knots. Then I reset the traps and placed them back in the holes. Very carefully, I covered each trap with leaves, but left the apples in plain sight. Backing off to one side, I took another good look at my trap setting. Every time I had set a trap, I had been proud of the way I had done it. But on that day, I was especially proud. You could see the pieces of apple all right, but you sure couldn't tell there were any traps there. Not one shiny piece of metal could be seen. 
Rowdy, I said, I don't care how smart that monkey is. If he gets one of those apples, he's going to wind up with a trap on his foot, and that's all there is to it. All of the time I was resetting my traps, I kept looking around in the trees for a monkey. I didn't see one, but I had a feeling that there were 10,000 monkeys' eyeballs looking right at me. Feeling about as smart as old Trapper Dan himself, I said, Come on, Rowdy. I think the monkey, I think the money will start rolling in now. I didn't go straight back to my hiding place. Instead, I took off in another direction, circled around, and came back to it. I thought that I was being smart doing this, but I felt silly too, because if that big monkey was sitting somewhere in the top of that sycamore tree, he was probably watching every move I made. I was so sure that I would catch a monkey this time, I didn't sit down on my gunny sack. I held it in my hand so that I'd be ready to sack him up the instant I heard the snap of my trap. It seemed that Rowdy and, and I had hardly gotten seated when there came the monkeys leaping, squealing, and chattering. Boy, Rowdy, I whispered, that sure was fast, wasn't it? They must have been waiting for us. Why, the way they're acting... They must think we're playing some kind of a game. They won't think it's a game when I get a few of them in the sack. It was a little different this time than it was before. The big monkey was the first one to touch the ground. And he was standing very close to one of my traps. The little monkeys were milling around everywhere. They didn't seem to know what was going on, but every time one got close to a trap, that big monkey would fly out of, out of gear like a mama jaybird when I wanted to take a look at her babies. He would scream like someone had slapped a branding iron on him and start jumping up and down and making those deep grunting noises. He would run at the little monkeys and scare the daylights out of them. Finally... He succeeded in herding them all to one side where they bunched up and stayed. If I had known then what a big monkey, what that big monkey was going to do next, I wouldn't have stayed there and watched it. Again, he walked over close to one of my traps and stopped. I knew that I was watching a monkey, but he still looked like a small boy standing there trying to figure something out. Once he even bent over so that he could get a better look at things. Then he reached up with one of those long arms and scratched his head. When I saw him do that, I thought of my grandpa. He always scratching on his head when he had something heavy on his mind. Rowdy, I whispered, I believe that monkey knows the trap is there and he is trying to figure out how he can get the apple and not get caught. I don't think he can do it. I don't care how smart he is. He's not that smart. How wrong I was. As if he had solved the problem and was tickled to death about it, the big monkey turned a few somersaults. He stopped and stared straight at my hiding place. Then he let out another one of those squalls before he reached down and picked up a long stick from the ground, holding the stick out in front of him, still uttering those deep grunts, and he started beating at the apple as if he was killing a snake. I almost jumped out of my britches when... I heard the trap snap. I sat in a trance, and I watched that $100 monkey spring every one of my traps the same way. Every time a trap snapped, he would look straight at my hiding place and squall. He didn't use his teeth to tear the apple from the triggers. He simply used his fingers and untied the knots in the strings. There was one thing I could say for that monkey. He wasn't only smart, 
He was very polite too. He saw to it that the little monkeys got their share of each apple. After it was all over and the monkeys had again disappeared into the treetops, I looked to Rowdy for some kind of understanding. I didn't get any help from him. He was just lying there with his long ears sticking straight up, looking at me as if there were the most surprised hound dog in the world. I was so dumbfounded. I couldn't even think straight, much less say anything. For several seconds, I sat there staring at the ground and trying to remember everything that had happened. The more I thought about how that big monkey had outsmarted me, the madder I got. Rowdy, I said, I wish I had brought Papa's old shotgun along. I'd sure warm that monkey's hide with some bird shot. It's bad enough that he made fool out of me, but he didn't have to laugh like that. I put my lunch and apples back in the gunny sack and walked over to where my traps were. Mashing the springs down with my foot, I released the sticks from the jaws. I put the traps back in my sack. Then I sat down on a stump to do a little thinking. I could remember every trick my grandpa had taught me about trapping, but I couldn't think of a thing that would catch a monkey. The more I thought about it, everything... The more I thought about everything, the more disgusted I got. Talking to myself, I said, there's only one thing I can do. I'll have to get rid of that smart aleck monkey. If I can get rid of him, I believe I, believe I can catch them little ones. They don't seem to have any sense at all. I'll just go to the house, get Papa's gun, and do away with that monkey once and for all. Then I thought, what in the world am I thinking of? I can't do that. Why, it would be like hanging a $100 bill in a tree and shooting it all to pieces. And there was the old man of the mountains. If I shot one of those silly monkeys and there was no telling what he would do, old Rowdy saved the day for me, or at least I thought so at the time. About 15 feet from the stump I was sitting on, there was a big hollow log. Rowdy was over there sniffing around. He never could keep his sniffer out of anything that had a hole in it. He just couldn't do things like that. The instant I saw the log, a plan jumped right out of the hollow end and bored its way into my monkey-troubled mind. I walked over to the log, got down on my knees, and looked back into the hollow. It was perfect. The hole was large and went back about four feet. I was so pleased I could have kissed old Rowdy, but he never did like to be kissed. Patting the log with my hand, I said, Rowdy, you could have sniffed all over these bottoms and not found anything this good. This is just what I've been looking for. I'll put my apples back in the hollow and set my traps out here in front. Now, if that smart monkey wants an apple, he'll have to wade through all of my traps to get one. And if he can do that and not get caught, then we're just beat, and that's all there is to it. Rowdy seemed to know that I was pleased about something. He reared up on me and tickled my ear with his long pink tongue. Come to think of it, Rowdy, I said, I'm starving to death for a drink of water. Let's go get a drink first, and then we'll really get after these monkeys. And not far away, at the upper end of an old slough, the cool, clear water of a spring gushed out from under the roots of a huge gum tree. I always figured that spring belonged to Rowdy and me. We had discovered it on one of our exploring trips. I even named it Jayberry Springs. We had a good drink and I washed my hot face in the cool water. There was never a time that Rowdy and I prowled those Cherokee bottoms that we didn't run into all kinds of surprises. But when I got back to our burr oak tree, I got the biggest surprise of my life. Everything I owned was gone. My gunny sack, 
lunch, apples, traps, and all. Rowdy, I said looking around, I know I left that sack right here by the stump. Now it's gone, and everything we had was in it. I wonder what happened to it. Rowdy started sniffing around the stump. Then he trailed over to the big sycamore, reared up on it, looked at me and whined. What are you doing that for, boy? I asked him. You know that sack can't climb a tree. Regardless of what I said, Rowdy seemed to think that sack had climbed the tree. He started bawling the bark. He started bawling the tree bark. I had never known my old dog to lie. So I looked up into the branches of the big sycamore. What I saw all but caused me to fall over backwards. Sitting on a limb with his back against the trunk was that hundred dollar monkey. He was just sitting there, as big as you please, with a sandwich in one paw and an apple in the other, eating away and looking straight at me. He had passed out my apples to some of the little monkeys. They were sitting around on the limbs, chewing away and peering at me with their beady little eyes. I could see my gunny sack with the traps in it draped over a limb. I felt the anger start way down in my feet. It burned its way through my body and exploded in my head. Why, you thieving rascal, I yelled. You can't get away with this. You give that stuff back to me. I saw right away that the big monkey had no intention of giving anything back to me. He stood up on the limb and started jumping up and down and laughing, fit to kill. This made me so mad, I came close to cussing a little. While hanging around my grandpa's store, I'd learned a few cuss words from the men, but I never did use them. I was afraid to. Daisy told me that if any boy wasn't 21 years old yet and he cussed, his tongue would rot out of his head. So I just didn't do any cussing. I didn't figure that I, I could get along without my tongue. But I was so mad at that monkey. He had to do, I, I had to do something. I grabbed up a chunk from the ground and I threw it at him as hard as I could. I didn't come close to hitting him, but it made him mad anyway. He let out a squall and threw one of my apples straight at me. I had to jump sideways to keep from getting from, from it hitting me. The idea of an old monkey throwing something at me was more than I could stand. I went all to pieces. I had a darn good bean shooter. And I was such a good shot, I could almost drive nails with it. I jerked it out of my pocket, and I reached for some ammunition when I discovered that I didn't have one little rock in my pocket. That really made me mad. It, I... It looked like everything in the world was going against me. Not far away was a washout, and the bottom was covered with gravel. I ran over and jumped down in it, dropping to my knees. I started filling my pockets with small rocks. Rowdy, I said, I don't care what the old man of the mountains or anyone else does. I'm not going to let that monkey get away with this. I'll make it so hot for him, he'll think that the woods are on fire. With my pockets bulging with ammunition, I climbed out of the washout and I ran back to the sycamore tree. The big monkey was still standing on the limb, jumping up and down and laughing his head off. I loaded my bean shooter and pulled the rubber band back as far as I could, taking dead aim. I let go. Old William Tell himself couldn't have shot any straighter than I did. I plunked that monkey a good one about where his belly button should have been. He let out a squall that could have been heard all over the bottoms, and he started scratching at the spot where my rock had stung him. I couldn't have been more pleased. <laughs> I reared back, and I laughed as loud as I could. How do you like that? I yelled at him. Not so funny now, is it? Well, you ain't seen anything yet. Chuckling to myself, I loaded up again, took dead aim, and Plunked him another good one. I never should have shot that big monkey the second time because it made him awfully mad. Turning to the little monkeys, he uttered a few of those deep grunts and every one of them started dropping down from the sycamore tree. 
This was the last thing in the world I expected the monkeys to do, and I didn't like what was happening at all. I started backing up one step at a time. Holy smokes, Rowdy, I said. They're coming after us. I didn't think they'd do that. Did you? By the time the big monkey had reached the last limb on the sycamore tree, I had a pretty good head start on him. He stopped there for a second, opened his big mouth, and showed me those long teeth again. I wouldn't have been more scared if someone had thrown a crosscut saw at me. I dropped my bean shooter and let out a squall that didn't even sound like me. They're going to eat us up, Rowdy, I yelled. Let's get out of here!